Happy Wednesday, folks, and welcome to episode 424 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for Wednesday, January 12th, 2022. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well, having a great week so far. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a question on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. A uh, few couple of things I do want to address before we get started here. A lot of interviews going up this week here on the channel. On Monday, we had my interview with Alan Maldonado, one of the stars from Psych 3, This Is Gus. He's also in Heels, uh, the show Blackish, among other shows and movies. A great guy. That interview was recorded a few months ago. Finally had a chance to put it up here on the channel late Monday night, so check that out in video form. All these are video interviews, by the way, on the first three anyway. Yesterday was my interview with uh, Camille Kostick of Wipeout, the on-field host for the revival of the show. She was also in Free Guy, the uh, girlfriend of Rob Gronkowski. Great girl. She was awesome to chat with about Wipeout and all things acting and everything else she's got going on right now. Um, she was great, again, also in video form here on the channel from yesterday. The article went up in um, article form. The interview went up in article form over on hiddenremote.com, so check that out. And then today, my interview with the uh, one of the hottest free agents, I would say, in wrestling right now, the very nice, very evil Dan Housen, uh, going up in video form here on the channel, so check that out. That was great to chat with him for over half an hour about the most random of things from, you know, wanting to sign at AEW, a potential run in WWE, an update on his injury, what makes Dan Housen so damn popular, why he's an internet sensation, uh, you know, meeting CM Punk, being inspired by Conan O'Brien, his thoughts on the Spider-Man Far From Home movie, or No Way Home, rather, that came out last month, favorite horror movies, his tattoos, and so much more. It was a really, 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 really fun interview, so check that out when you get a chance. Also went up an article form over on Bleach Report earlier today, and then at some point, hopefully in the next few days, will be my chat with the Ring of Honor World Champion Jonathan Gresham and Baron Black. They're going to be heading up Terminus, the new promotion, starting on Saturday. Um, that interview was recorded a few weeks ago, just haven't had a chance to write it up yet or post it, so that will be up in audio form. We did it over video, but it just didn't come out great because Baron Black's internet wasn't the greatest, so it wasn't the strongest. So we're going to put it up in audio instead in audio form. Just have to edit it and do that sort of stuff before it goes live in a couple days here on the channel. So keep an eye out for that and check out my other interviews, like I mentioned, going up in the last couple of days with Alan Maldonado on Monday, Tuesday, Camille Costick, and today, Dan Housen. I know quite the cast of characters, but they were all very fun to do. So let's get into the questions, starting with Joe M. from YouTube. His first question was, do you think there's a double standard in fans with how they give how they give AEW the benefit of the doubt for not featuring Brian Cage for months, killing any momentum he's built up in the process, but they jumped down WWE's throats for how they would treat guys like Keith Lee and Karrion Cross? I think it's two different issues. The problem with Brian Cage isn't the fact that, like with Keith Lee and Karrion, where... I have an issue with both companies for all the people you mentioned, by the way. I'm not picking sides here. I'm, there's no double standard as far as I'm concerned, as far as, like, I go. Um, I think AEW, I, I don't know if Brian Cage is still hurt. The thing is, is that with WWE, I think more so the problem is Brian Cage very well might be hurt. We don't know that because no one has reported on it. I don't know if it's the fact that no one gives a fuck about Brian Cage, but I hear injury reports from people in WWE about people I don't give a fuck about all the time, like, where is so-and-so? But we find out, okay, they're hurt, and these people don't have to go on their Twitters and comment on it. It's not really up to Brian or X, Y, or Z to really say, hey, I'm not around right now because I'm hurt. Um, I don't know if that falls on the dirt sheets or whatever, but I think it falls on the fans because I feel like if the fans were asking questions as to where this person is, then they'll find out. Like, in WWE, there's people that are still out injured right now um, that we know are inactive for such and such reason. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like the fans are more so saying, oh, they're not using this person, why not? And then we find out that they're hurt. Why aren't people complaining about the lack of Brian Cage or even Lance Archer on AEW TV? We haven't seen Lance Archer on TV since October, since he got hurt with that concussion. Um, not, not got hurt, but, you know, they took him off of TV. I think he was fine right after the fact, but he was a bit banged up, and it was a, it was a scary spot. But that was three months ago. I, I would assume he's okay by now. And if he's not, why aren't fans saying, hey, where is Lance Archer? Where is Brian Cage? Where is this person and that person? I definitely think there's a double standard there as far as the fans are concerned for not speaking up for people like Brian or Lance and saying, hey, why the fuck aren't they using these people? There very well might be a legitimate reason as to why they're not on TV. 
I still don't think that Ricky Starks isn't on TV all that much because he's still feeling the ramifications of the neck injury from a year ago. I think he himself has said either in an interview or on Twitter, I think before he deleted it, I'm not sure if he's back on Twitter now, but he deleted it like around New Year's Day, I remember. Someone had asked him, where's Ricky Starks? He's not hurt anymore. Like, I think he's 100% clear to compete. He doesn't need to be limited. He doesn't need to be kept to tag team matches. Like, he had a fucking street fight with Brian Cage three months ago, three, four months ago, whatever it was. He's wrestled on TV a bunch. He had a FTW title defense, a pretty full-length match against Matt Seidel on Saturday. I don't think the guy's hurt. So why the hell, <clears throat> excuse me, why the hell aren't they using him more? Brian House, or uh, Powerhouse Hobbs as well. Brian Cage, Archer, again, probably still de- probably still dealing with injuries. But why aren't fans saying, oh, where's this person? Where's that person? Regardless of whether they're hurt or not, we hear that all the time from fans of WWE. And people that aren't WWE fans are probably going to say the same thing. Oh, where's this person? Where's that person? Like Finn Balor, for example. I, I, I've seen people say, where's Finn Balor? That's an accurate question to ask. Where is Finn Balor? I don't think he's sick. Um, he was at the MSG house show that I went to a few weeks ago. Austin Theory was off TV at that point. They were feuding. Um, it, maybe he did get sick since then. I don't know, with COVID or whatever, or he got hurt. I, I don't think so. But uh, he was feuding with Theory. Theory wasn't on TV, so they put Balor, they took Balor off the show temporarily. Theory's been back for a week or two now. We have had no sign of Finn Balor on TV. People will say, oh, they're burying Finn Balor. Where's Finn Balor? Blah, blah, blah. But there won't be a peep about a Brian Cage or a Lance Archer. I, I know people, not a lot of people care about Brian Cage, but... Archer's a pretty prominent, uh, you know, fan favorite in my opinion. With with Keith and Carrion, with fans jumping down WWE's throat as far as that is concerned, that was more so creative decisions. Um, if Brian Cage came out wearing a stupid ass mask, I'm I'm sure people would actually say something. With Keith, the whole Bearcat shit and Carrion Cross coming out with the Shredder mask, looking ridiculous before both guys were fired promptly a few months later. Um, that was a different issue because how can you not complain about that? I mean, they looked fucking ridiculous. There was no defending it, and it played a factor in their release from the company. There's not a lot of people who come out on the shows in AEW and have a dumb character or... I mean, some of the characters I just don't get. Um, and, and like the librarian shit, I think people kind of let AEW know, hey, this isn't working, we don't care, it's fucking stupid, please stop doing it, and they did. Nightmare Collective, same thing. It was a stable that sucked. They heard the fans, and they pulled the plug on it pretty quickly. So they listen to the fans more often than not. I can't name anything off the top of my head right now, but there are certain storylines in AEW that I just don't think are the greatest, and fans kind of give them a pass. That does happen quite a bit. Joe's second question. Since the idea of Brock Lesnar winning, getting, or winning, um, getting screwed out of the championship and then entering and winning the Royal Rumble, I think is what he meant to say, um, has been floated around by guys like Solomon. So how would you like to see that final... Man, uh, Brock, tossing out Braun Breaker. So, again, kind of a weirdly worded question. But I think he's saying, if Brock's going to win the Rumble, and I agree with Solomon, or I agree with you. I'm not, not saying that I think he should, but I don't really know who else you have win it. Big E would be great. I don't see Big E being in a world championship match at WrestleMania. I don't. They never really position him as the guy. They could always rectify that and book him better going forward. He had a great match with Rollins on Monday before he lost. He looked great in defeat. I just don't think they see him in that position. If you had asked me six to eight months ago, I probably would say, yeah, Big E winning the Rumble. I mean, had he not won Money in the Bank, I, I wouldn't have done that necessarily or had him cash in as a surprise. I would have had him cash in ahead of time or whatever. But anyway, they never really booked him as the guy, which makes me think that he won't be in a WWE title match at WrestleMania. And if he is, I don't think it's headlining the show. I really don't. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, with Brock, I do also think he's winning the Rumble. I think he's probably losing... Not probably. I would. I, I'm not guaranteeing that he's losing to Bobby. Not at all. I mean, Brock could always win the Rumble as the WWE Champion. That is also very possible. I don't really want Brock to win the Rumble. I do think there's a very good chance it happens. Um, but regardless of whether it does or doesn't, he's saying in the scenario that he does win, would it be cool, basically, if it, it was Braun Breaker was the last guy he threw out? I think that would be awesome. I don't think there would be much doubt if it came down to Brock and Braun that Brock would be winning. Braun Breaker is the current NXT champion. Had he lost the chump, I would be thinking, okay, maybe they are fast-tracking him to the main roster. I wouldn't do it just now. I don't think I would complain about Braun Breaker you know, winning the Royal Rumble and going in to face Roman Reigns, for example, at WrestleMania, because why the fuck not at this point? But 
still, I, regardless of the predictability, it would be a pretty great spot for Braun to be in. And so far, he's been a shining star in that NXT 2.0 brand. Um, he's been booked great. He's had very good matches, cutting quality promos. He's more comfortable now from what, I've under, from what I've seen. And I've interviewed him twice now. The second time, he was far more comfortable than he was the first time. And uh, that, that's in the matter of a month. If that guy can continue at that rate going forward, this guy will be a champion in the main roster by the end of the year. Like, no if ands, or buts about it. But, um, yeah, with Brock and Braun, that would be an awesome finish. I don't see that happening at all. I mean, that's assuming Braun's even in it, which would be cool. Um, we'll see. I, I would love to see it. The chances of that actually happening are very slim, but it would be quite the visual, though. And quite the endorsement for Braun Breaker from Brock Lesnar. No L from Facebook, their first question was, who should be the one to beat Mandy Rose for the NXT Women's Championship? You know, I was just talking with someone about this last night. I think it's got to be Cora Jade. Um, the NXT women's roster isn't exactly as diverse as it once was, unfortunately. Maybe not diverse, but like as far as like the depth isn't there as much as it was even six to eight months ago. They've gotten rid of so many women from Taya Valkyrie, Mercedes Martinez. Tegan Knox was there, got called up, fired. Uh, Tony Storm was there, got called up, fired. Ember Moon got brought back. She got fired. Um, they called up Shotzi, Raquel's probably on her way out. They just don't really have the depth anymore. I feel like it's toxic attraction. Zoe Stark is her. I don't give a fuck about Zoe Stark. I'm going to be honest. She's a good wrestler. I just really don't care about her at all. Saray is a, a total non-factor. I'm shocked she's even still there. Electra Lopez is no good. Um, she's getting better, but she's not remotely there yet. Raquel is, is good. She's improved. I just don't think she's there for the long haul. Um, you have Io Shirai still. I, they haven't really done a lot with her. Kaylee Ray, same thing. I, I think they want to put over one of their own stars to get that rub for Mandy. And Kaylee Ray is a baby face, but I just don't see them putting the belt on her, to be honest with you, in this NXT 2.0 rebrand. I think it's going to be Cora Jade. Cora Jade was the one pinned in that triple threat last week in New Year's Evil, but they can always build her getting another shot and uh, kind of overcoming Mandy to become champion. So it's a great dynamic, too, because Mandy's all about the looks and whatever, and Cora Jade's like this underdog skate pop punk girl whatever um I think it would be a great moment and I think she's she's ready for it too and she's only like 20 years old which is wild which is crazy to think about but she's also very good for her level of experience and uh, I would have it be Cora Jade maybe not like next week but in the next few months I could totally see it being Cora Jade uh, taking that title from Mandy Rose their second question do you think WWE will finally start working with other companies besides Impact I don't. Um, I think the Impact thing is a one-off, I think, because they felt like they had no women for the Women's Royal Rumble. They wanted to surprise people, get people talking, win-win for Impact. They get a lot of exposure out of it. If, if Mickey James comes out with the Impact Knockouts Championship, and I don't think she will, um, <coughs> excuse me, that would be great exposure for them. Doesn't hurt to get a uh, mention on WWE TV after already being featured on AEW and, and New Japan and all this other stuff. Impact's fucking killing it right now. Their hard-to-kill pay-per-view, by the way, on Saturday, this past Saturday, was excellent. One of the best pay-per-views I've seen from them in a long time, and that is saying something, is all of their pay-per-views for the last two or three, four years have been great. So that's saying quite a bit. But anyway, um, I don't see WWE working with other companies. MLW actually just came out last night with a lawsuit saying that WWE cost them opportunities and a TV deal with Tubi, I think, and all this other stuff. Poaching talent while still under contract. And the thing, <coughs> the, thing the thing about that is that it wouldn't be the first time that something like that has happened. On the MLW front, real quick, it actually came out earlier last year, and I think Court Bauer confirmed this, um, one of the lead people in charge of MLW, The WWE was actually trying to work with them on, on something. I don't know what it was. Maybe uh, like a, there being like a developmental show and that was when Triple H was still in NXT. He's not there right now, and he probably won't be back. Um, so that obviously wasn't going to happen. But they tried working with them. MLW countered with a lawsuit, and that's that. But again, that's not the first time that something like that has happened. You go all the way back to 2017, Ring of Honor, I think, also sued WWE. And maybe even years before that as well. I feel like they had tried to do something like that. Ring of Honor did back in like 2012, 2013, around there where they were, again, poaching talent and kind of contract tampering and doing stuff like that because they wanted people that Ring of Honor had and were talking to them before they were contractually able to, which is why we saw that giant influx of people once it died down. By the end of 2017, WWE from Ring of Honor picked up Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, Kyle O'Reilly, um, Leo Rush, and Donovan Dijak, 
or Donovan Dijakovic or whatever. Uh, that's five people, and, and Roderick was already there from the year prior. They had already picked up a bunch of other Ring of Honor stars in years past, so it, it was crazy. It was really, really crazy, and uh, now we're kind of seeing something similar with MLW, but to answer your question, if they're still doing that type of shit, um, <coughs> seemingly, then it's not a good look for WWE, and and uh, I just don't see companies wanting to work with them. I know they're the biggest company in town, the biggest wrestling company out there, but if they're going to be doing shit like that, then why would anyone want to work with them? You know what I mean? So AEW, I've, I've seen and heard, I think Tony can, Tony Khan confirmed that WWE has wanted to work with them and use some of their talent for like documentaries and stuff like that, which makes sense. Like, I, like the Jericho being in the Rumble thing, maybe, but I don't know. I just don't really see that happening, so... I guess we'll see, but uh, I, I just don't see WWE working with bigger promotions. I know they worked with Progress before and, and, and Evolve before they bought them. Um, I just don't see them working with the bigger companies because WWE notoriously has never played well with others. And if they have, then it just doesn't last too long. So time will tell. I just don't see it happening. At Reborn again, John Ritland, the birthday boy. Check out a show on YouTube as well. Real Honesty with John Ritland celebrating a birthday the other day. Very happy birthday to John. He's an awesome dude. His first question was, so Piper Niven, and I refuse to call her by that other name, he says, is facing Becky Lynch at the Royal Rumble. What are your expectations for that match? Also, who is the heel? I'm looking forward to it. Honestly, when they did that triple threat on Raw this week, for starters, it was it was unpredictable as to who was going to win. I like that portion of it, that, that aspect of it. It was very believable that Liv could get a third shot. Didn't want to see it. I like Liv a lot. She's gotten her shot. She's gotten her matches. She's not going to beat Becky at the Rumble, so I'm glad that didn't happen. Bianca, I, I was thinking, okay, maybe she'll win, but the thing with me is, if they're going to save Bianca, like, that's a WrestleMania match. Are they going to do Rhea and Becky at WrestleMania? Then maybe then do Bianca and Becky now. Based on the finish of what we got on Monday, they're going to save that for WrestleMania. I mean, I guess they could do it in between now and WrestleMania. I, at this point, I would just wait till WrestleMania. Maybe she wins the Rumble. I'll talk about that later. Who knows? But I like the fact that Dewdrop won, Piper Niven, whatever. She's very talented. She had great matches with Bianca. She hasn't had a lot of luck as far as her win-loss record is concerned. But she's like one of those second-tier... St I mean, there really aren't a lot of women's wrestling stars in WWE in general right now. They don't have a lot of women, period. But she's one of those people underneath the title picture, now in the title picture, that has kind of flown under the radar. I think she's doing great work as a heel. They got to ditch the dumb Dewdrop name. I completely agree with you. I don't know anyone that would say, oh, keep Dewdrop. Even Marie doesn't even work there anymore. What purpose does this stupid dude drop name serve? What purpose does that serve? But anyway, um, I like her being in the title picture. She's not going to win. Who's the heel? It doesn't even really matter. The thing is, is that we're already getting Bobby Lashley and Brock and Roman and Seth. Bobby is a heel. He's more of the baby face in that feud than Brock. And Brock's a baby face, I guess, too. Realistically, neither guy is a baby face, a full on, full fledged baby face. Definitely not Roman Reigns or Seth Rollins. So it's the Rumble. It doesn't even really matter. We've gotten matches like this at the Rumble before between two heels. They did Randy Orton and Sheamus. I remember not a very good match, but for the WWE Championship back in 2010, because it doesn't matter. Like the show's all about the Rumbles. And I like this because you could say, oh yeah, it's all about the Rumble. So why not give the spot to a Liv Morgan? At least it's something new. It should be a good match. I think it could be a good match. I don't know if it's the greatest idea when you want to get over Becky as a heel, and she's definitely going to get cheered over Dewdrop at the show. I don't know about that, but as a match, I'm looking forward to it. I think it could be a good match. Dewdrop is very talented. It's something we haven't seen before, and that's something we very rarely say with this company. It's always the same fucking rematches, but we've never seen this before, so I'm on board with it. Obviously, Becky's going to win, I would say. I'd be shocked if Dewdrop won. I wouldn't do that. But I like the fact that she won on Monday's Raw, and I'm looking forward to the match of the pay-per-view. John's second question. Chad Gable is now a four-time tag team champion. Is there any chance they actually utilize him as a single star, or has that ship sailed? That ship sailed, sunk down to the bottom of the sea years ago. I hate to say it, but I think their best bet for utilizing, I think the, re like the last real opportunity they had, Excuse me, to, to use Chad Gable as a single star. I'm still trying to get over a cold, by the way, so that's why I'm like coughing and I'm barely, you know, I'm not completely out of breath, but that's why my, uh, I, I still sound slightly congested. But yeah, so I feel like the last chance they had with Chad Gable to get him over as a single star was during the King of the Ring, 2019. 
Um, he had just broken off from Bobby Roode, Robert Roode, whatever. Chad, I think, went to SmackDown. Roode stayed on Raw. He was on his own again. He was doing some 205 Live stuff, had some good matches over there. But then he was in the King of the Ring and had a great run of matches with a series of people, had a great finals with Corbin, and then they did nothing to capitalize off of that. He lost to Corbin a bunch. He beat him maybe once, but they did nothing with that and then had him call himself fucking Shorty G for a year, which was awful. And then as soon as the Shorty G stuff, you know, played its, played out and whatever, ran its course, they then put him with Otis, which I didn't like. I mean, they, they work well as a team now and I like Alpha Academy. But, like, Otis just came out of a tag team. Gable's already been in three tag teams already with a a number of people. He'd already teamed with Jason Jordan. He teamed with Shelton Benjamin. He teamed with Bobby Roode. This is his fourth partner on the main roster, his fourth full-time tag team partner. And all of whom, by the way, I don't think with Shelton, he never won tag team gold. Um, Who did he win? Wait, did they? Because you just said he's a four-time tag team champion. With with Bobby, they held the belts once. Oh, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. So he held, he held the tag titles with Jordan twice, once in NXT and then once on SmackDown. That's what it was. Uh, and he held the Raw tag team titles with Bobby. But yeah, I, I feel like 2019 was their last opportunity. After that kind of fell through, that to me just kind of told me, all right, they're never going to utilize this guy on his own. They're never going to give him a proper singles push. They just don't care. I don't see it happening. And the Alpha Academy stuff, hey, at least he's on the, at least he's on the show. You know, it's better than nothing. They work well together. He's a champion again. Better than nothing. I mean, if he were to leave and go to AEW, would they utilize him as a single star? Maybe, but they're so overbloated with talent at this point in 2022, it's very unlikely he would get a proper push over there either. He probably would just get lost in the shuffle. Um, they just never really saw the star potential potential in him that I think a lot of us did on his own. But again, tag team stuff, better than nothing. I think that singles push, though, is definitely, the, the ship for that is totally sailed, I would say, by this point. John's third question, assuming you saw any of Wrestle Kingdom 16, Night 1 and 2, what were your thoughts? Did any matches stick out to you for good or bad? I did catch both nights. I actually wrote up a review of both nights on WrestleRant.com, so if you haven't checked that out already, please do. Um, it's, I have my own category on the site of New Japan reviews. I don't do them often at all, but I did review Night 1 and Night 2 of Wrestle Kingdom last year, so I did it this year as well. Um, night 1 was fine. Night 2 was better. I like the show. I, I just, to me, I can't get into the New Japan stuff. I like the matches, and I tune in every year to some stuff from Wrestle Kingdom, if not the whole show. There's just so much fucking content that they do, and I know you could say the same thing about WWE, but one, I cover WWE, so I kind of have to watch everything, and two, it's just, it's a lot easier, more to me, in my opinion anyway, a lot easier accessible, much, much easier to access, you know, access that sort of stuff on Peacock and on WWE TV. New Japan, it's not like, all right, we have a show every Monday and for two hours or an hour. It's like they have just random events and they're just way too fucking long. I could barely get through Wrestle. It took me like four days to watch Wrestle Kingdom Night Day from the other from from last week because it's like five hours long if you include the pre-show. I was not watching Night Three. I don't really care about Pro Wrestling Noah. I'm just I've, I've reached the point where I'm not gonna watch New Japan full time, but I will tune into the bigger shows as I have before. Uh, like Wrestle Kingdom, and I liked it, and I liked the main events for both shows, I liked Shingo Takagi and uh, Okada on night one, excellent match, Okada and Osprey on night two, two stars, fucking loved it, great match, I also really liked the Tanahashi and Kenta match from night two, the no disqualification match for the US Championship, I just don't care about like the tag team matches, and I know they do that as like a preview for the next night, but I feel like if WWE did that sort of thing, people would be pissed, I just don't think at this point, the current state that Wrestle Kingdom is in with people leaving or just not being able to travel, like they didn't have Jay White, Kota Bushi got hurt, people have gotten sick. I, I don't think Wrestle Kingdom needed to be two nights this year. I don't. I know it was the third night too with, with Pro Wrestling Noah. The two night thing is probably here to stay. I just, with the current roster depth and, and whatever, I just don't think two nights is necessary. Uh, but I did like both shows, they were enjoyable. Um, I thought like, I don't know, like they, they used to say, Oh, uh, Wrestle Kingdom is the best show of the year. If Wrestle Kingdom 16 is anyone's show of the year in 2022, I would say you're a fucking Homer from new Japan because there is no way that either night is the show of the year. They were good. Night two might've been great, but like overall there were more stuff I didn't care about than matches that I did. 
Like, I like the Kenta Tanahashi match. I like the two main events. I like Jeff Cobb, and I think it was Naito. I like that match a lot. The Great Okan just fucking bores me to tears. Evil shenanigans in his matches is just fucking terrible. Um, the Toriano stuff I enjoy. I still find it entertaining, but I, I don't know. Just the majority of the matches on, on both nights were just kind of there to me, especially all the tag team matches for the most part. Um, Takahashi and Desperado was a really good match. I enjoyed that, but I, I wouldn't go back and watch both nights in their entirety if I wasn't reviewing them. I think the top match is totally delivered. Beyond that, the undercard to me kind of felt like it was lacking. It, which, you know, that's no different for an AEW or a WWE, but the problem is that people overhype New Japan so much and call these shows like the best of the year. Obviously, the current circumstances don't help with people only being able to clap and not make noise beyond that. But, like, people say, oh, this is going to be the best pay-per-view of the year, and then I watch it, and I'm very much underwhelmed. You know, like, I expect more from New Japan at this point, because I've seen other Wrestle Kingdoms from them that were amazing. Um, I, I didn't get that same feeling with Wrestle Kingdom 16 at all. And again, I know it's the circumstances and a lot of factors go into it, but this year's show kind of felt like it was one of the weaker ones compared to years past. At Iwagu91 from Twitter, when do you expect Wardlow to finally turn on MJF? Wardlow was in the news today. Uh, at WrestleVote said, tweeted the WWE Pro Wrestling Insider account that um, a lot of people in WWE, very high on Wardlow, and why the fuck would they not be? I mean, I think the guy's a breakout babyface waiting to happen. He also did an interview, coincidentally, like today or yesterday, saying that he was a lifer in AEW. Now, I don't, I mean, does he, is, could he end his career there? Sure. Could he go to WWE? It's totally possible. If they offer him the right amount of money, the guy would be a moron to stay in AEW. I, I, to me, he feels more like a WWE guy anyway. But either way, I think he's a future breakout star waiting to happen. Um, when will he turn on MJF? I would say wait until after MJF wins the world championship, which is inevitable. But at the rate they've been putting him on TV lately and teasing tension with Sean Spears, it really feels like it's coming on the sooner side. I don't think it would be tonight following his match with Punk. People have said, oh, maybe in Cleveland. He's from Cleveland. They're in Cleveland for the Beach Break show in fucking January, which makes no sense. Um, but they're doing that at the end of the month. Could he turn babyface there? I guess, but like is Wardlow and MGF the Revolution match? I think the Revolution match... Actually, I don't really know. I think the Revolution match should be Punk and MJF. That's the match you do at the pay-per-view. Save Wardlow turning on MJF for a different time. I would save it until after MJF is the champion. Does M does Wardlow go over MJF and win the bill? I don't know about that, but that's a feud I would save for later on in the year. It totally feels like it's coming soon, and I'm fine with that. I'm much more open to the idea now than I was a year or so ago. Um, I just wouldn't do it until after MJF becomes champion, and I don't think at the very least... MJF is becoming champion until at least double or nothing in May, at the earliest, in my opinion. Um, their second question, what are your thoughts on Braun Breaker kicking the X out of the black and gold logo of NXT? I love the entrance. I mean, I didn't really see anything to it. I mean, it was obvious that they did it to end the NXT era, that, that, that black and gold era of NXT. People were pissed behind the scenes, and I get that. But from a fan perspective, I thought it came off cool. It was obviously a fucking Styrofoam X or whatever it was, but... I don't know. Personally, me, I'm easily satisfied. I thought it came off cool. And uh, we, we talked about that. That interview will be out next week for Bleach Report, myself and Braun, the new NXT champion. But uh, yeah, just keep an eye on that and uh, whether that's you know going to be going anywhere. But like, I, I think they did that to kind of indicate that era of NXT is over, which it is. And the very next day, they fired fucking William Regal, Samoa Joe, and a bunch of other people, which was completely ridiculous. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't mind. A lot of people thought it was stupid or it was hokey, which I get. I completely understand it. But for me personally, I liked it. Even though it is sad to see that era of NXT end, it was inevitable. And they might as well do it in that fashion by having Braun Breaker become NXT champion last week in New Year's Evil. Um, their third question, where do you see Brian Danielson following his loss to Hangman Adam Page? I don't know. We might get a better idea tonight. I think it's more likely he takes some time off, like he's not on the show for a few weeks, and then he comes back. I think he's going back to being a babyface. I think he was only acting like a heel for the Hangman feud. I don't think it's going to be happening. I don't think he's a heel from here on out, is my thing. Who do you pair him with next? I don't know. Darby's kind of currently busy, I think, with Andrade. Cody? Uh, I don't know about that. I don't think Brian needs to be at the TNT level. Um... <coughs> Excuse me. I'm not sure. I really don't know. Um, that, that's what's kind of 
Intriguing to me is where you go with Danielson from here. He's one of the best in that entire company, if not the best. So you got to obviously put him in a prominent spot going into the Revolution pay-per-view. I just, there's no one obvious opponent, I don't think, at this current point in time for Daniels into that pay-per-view. So I am, I'm very much curious, as much as you are, to see where they go with him from here. At Justin David Kish from Twitter, buy or sell Wardlow or Braun Breaker? Great question. We just got done talking about both guys. Oh, man. I know the buy or sell is like a solemn monster thing, but buy or sell on Wardlow or Breaker? I got to buy on Breaker, sell on Wardlow. Um, I think Breaker, Wardlow is going to be a big baby face. The thing with Breaker, with Wardlow for me, like I just got done talking about, after he wins or loses against MJF, where do you go with him from there? In AEW, anyway. I think in WWE, I just, I feel like with AEW, they have big guys with potential. Like, Brian Cage is on the older side, I know. But I feel like they don't have a lot of bigger guys that they're doing anything with. Like, Archer... Even Miro never really got above a certain point. Like, they haven't done... I mean, I guess he got hurt, but... I don't know. I just feel like AEW is a place for smaller, more average-sized guys than the bigger guys. I feel like with the bigger guys... I mean, Omos is fucking terrible. Like, Aziz isn't great either. But WWE just kind of fits that mold more. Maybe it's because it's bigger arenas. I, I don't know, but... I just feel like Wardlow is a guy that would thrive in WWE. Hobbs is another one. He's a big guy. They've done jack shit with him in AEW so far. Breaker, I, again, they could call him up and completely fuck this guy up. But just given his family lineage, he can speak, he can go, he's got intensity, he can connect with a crowd. He just looks like a guy that, he's a star. Wardlow's a star too. I just don't know what you do with him. I feel like there's a lot more people you can pair Breaker off with and have him beat, and it's believable, than Wardlow currently in AEW. Like, does a hangman Wardlow feud really jump off the page to me right now? No. Him and Brian currently? No. Like, we haven't seen enough of him in the ring to really get a gist of how much he's actually able to do. He's impressive, and he strikes me as Batista type competitor. But Breaker, I feel like, is just capable of so much more um, with a variety of opponents. So I, I got to go Breaker. Maybe I'm wrong, and Wardlow ends up becoming world champion in both companies, and Breaker never really amounts to his full potential, but based on what we've seen with Breaker so far, and he's so early on in his career, and the guy is already ready for the main roster, that to me tells me he's going to be a bigger deal, I think, than Wardlow. Um, his second question, do you think the House of Black could be a faction that comes to AEW with Malachi Black, Brody King, and possibly Killer Cross? I wasn't thinking about Cross, but that's not a bad fit. It's not a bad fit. I don't know who else would be in the stable. Be I'm, Brody King is a, is a obviously can happen. It's either tonight. I thought it would happen last week. It's happening very, very, very soon. It could very well be tonight. Brody King is absolutely all elite and he's absolutely going to be with Malachi. There's no question about that. Who else do you put with them? I don't know. Um, I would say Dan Hazen, but he's more of like a comedy guy. Uh, Killer Cross is an option because he's very creative. I don't know, man. I feel like Killer Cross would be a good, uh, would be a good choice though. Um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. They can get creative with it. They can have some good matches together, that trio. I feel like Killer, I don't know. I feel like Malachi and Killer kind of cancel each other out because they're a very similar stature and whatnot. I mean, Brody King's also a big guy. I don't know. I feel like you might need someone smaller in there or someone with a different stature than Brody and Malachi. But Killer Cross wouldn't be a bad idea. I think that's, I wasn't really thinking about that, but that would be a good idea. At Kyle Rochelle 19 from Twitter, can Bianca Belair become number one contender some other way without winning the Royal Rumble again? I'm okay with Becky Lynch and Bianca at WrestleMania. Just have Bianca win some other way. Hey, there is another way. It's called the Elimination Chamber. I think other than 2019, there was a year they didn't do Elimination Chamber before WrestleMania. Maybe I'm thinking of like 2016 or something, but beyond that, they've done Elimination Chamber before Mania every year. I don't necessarily agree with it as like a title thing, because the title never fucking changes hand inside the Elimination Chamber, which is statistically impossible. But if you want to use the Chamber, Chambers, to crown new number one contenders for the men and women, Bianca winning that would make perfect sense. She was the sole survivor at Survivor Series last year. She won the Rumble last year. She's overcome the odds before. Her, she's won, I think, no, she didn't win War Games. Did she? I don't remember. Um, but yeah, I think her winning Elimination Chamber would be perfect for her character and perfect for her so she wouldn't have to win the Rumble. I wouldn't be upset if Bianca won the Rumble at this point. 
you can't have a fresh face win every fucking year. I get it. And uh, I just don't know who else you have win for the women. If it is Bianca and, and Becky at WrestleMania, then Bianca winning the Rumble would make sense, and she could become the first person in a very long time to win it in back-to-back years. And it would be the first for it would be a first for the women too. So it would be historic, so, which is why I wouldn't be opposed to it. It's not like it's Charlotte winning again. Like Charlotte winning again would be fucking stupid. Charlotte should absolutely not win. If Bianca and Becky is the Mania match, the only other person that would make sense to win would be Sasha, but she's out. Like if Sasha faces Charlotte and Mania, which is what I'm expecting as of now, then she's hurt though, so she can't win. So it really just comes down to Bianca, to be honest. So. I don't know, maybe, <laughs> excuse me, maybe they surprised us with someone else. Again, Rhea's an option, because Rhea lost last year. She came up short against Bianca last year. Um, I just don't know if Rhea's going to Mania, though. I feel, unless they do Bianca before Mania, I don't know. But save Rhea for after Mania, maybe. Either way, I wouldn't have as much of an issue as I would have. Like, thinking about it now, I wouldn't mind it. But, if you want to have someone else win the Rumble, who that would be, I don't know, and have Bianca earn a title shot at Mania a different way, the Elimination Chamber is the way to go. And it would fit her perfectly, like I said. Final two questions from at SupersonicX 1991. First question from Twitter. What are your thoughts on the return of NWA to YouTube, who will be the breakout star in NWA this year for the men and the women? Uh, for the men, I'm going with Darius Lockhart. And for the women, I'm going with Natalia Markova and Christy Janes. I don't know who Christy Janes is. I watched the NWA. I don't know who that is. I didn't watch Power yet this week. Markova, I've seen before. She doesn't strike me as someone who has a lot of potential. The NWA, <coughs> Jesus Christ, excuse me. Um, they have a decent amount of good women. Like I think Tootie Lynn is very uh, is a lot of potential. She's very talented. Sky Blue, if they continue to use her, I, I thought AEW was going to sign her, but who knows? Kira Hogan's also good. Um, she has a lot of potential. Breakout, like if Sky Blue continues to be featured, then her. Um, I just don't know if they will. Um, Tootie Lynn as well, like I said, she, she's quite good. Lady Frost was there, but then I think she's an impact now. So they have a lot of women to choose from. I wouldn't go with either one of those women personally, but maybe Markova can go farther than I'm expecting. Darius Lockhart, I don't think they've used him once, but I think he's supposed to be in that light heavyweight title tournament or was. He is very intriguing to me. I think he can be a breakout star. Um, who else? I, I don't really know. I mean, the NWA product right now is just kind of there. Like, they got fucking Zack Ryder and, and Trevor Murdoch in their world title picture, which is fine, and I like Cardona a lot, but it's not like exactly like they're building new stars at a rapid rate. Like, they got Pope, who's good, but he's been around for 15 years. Nick all this has been around for over a decade. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're not exactly building new a lot of new stars. Ricky Starks would have been one of them before he left for the AD, for before he left for AEW. Um, I, I can't really tell you another person that really jumps out to me as someone that can get behind and really build up. Um, but Darius Lockhart would be one of them. I don't think NWA is back on YouTube full time. I think they're just back on YouTube for the NWA USA show, if I'm not mistaken. I would love if, if Power, I mean, unless they announced it last night and I missed it. I don't think Power is going to be back on YouTube. I think you're just talking about NWA USA. It's an easy half hour show. I don't think it's really necessary for them to have another show right now, but it's, it's interesting, I guess. And, um... Yeah, it's free on YouTube. You're not paying $5 for it on Fight TV, which I proudly do for power because I like power, but, you know, it is kind of a, not not a ripoff when the show's not great, but it's just like, I used to get it for free, so why would I, why would I want to pay for it now? And it's not like the show's that much better than it was two or three years ago. It's probably worse. So that's the thing. Um, anyway, their second question here, where is the Serena Deeb and Akurashida, uh, Akurashida feud going afterwards? In all honesty, that, that feud is the AEW version of the Asuka and Charlotte Flair feud. I wouldn't go that far. The Asuka and Charlotte feud, they just keep going back to. Like, they would do the feud, like, in they did it in 2018, and then they moved away from each other. They went back to it in 2019, they moved away from each other. They went back to it in 2020, moved away from it. Went back to it in 2021, moved away from it. Like, with Sheeta and Deeb, it's just a lot of fucking matches. It's been a great feud, and they're having awesome matches. But yeah, is this going to build to a fifth match? Like, I thought three was fine. I'm not going to complain about getting more matches between the two, because they're good. And I'm glad they're actually doing progression with the women, and interviews, and, and segments and stuff backstage. It would be nice if we got in-ring promo time from both women, or a segment building up the feud in the ring. I guess they don't have the TV time for that, which is bizarre to me, on Rampage or Dynamite three hours of TV, can't find fucking 
three minutes to build this feud up in the ring. Like, I don't get that. But I've enjoyed it. Dave is great. Sheeta finally has something going on. I can't really complain. Like, it, they've had a lot of matches. Like, it's, this is going to be their fourth match tonight. They're all good. Um, it's nice to have a secondary feud in that women's division that's not over a championship. It gets both women on TV. Where is it going is the question. I don't really know. Like, they might very well build to a fifth match. Like, one of these matches has got to have a fucking stipulation. Like, they've had three or four matches so far. None of them have had a step. Yet we get Penelope Ford and Ty Conti for no real reason on Rampage in a submission hold match. Like, what the fuck? So, I'm enjoying the matches. Anything more than what we get tonight is probably overkill. We're probably already in that territory. At least they're good matches. At least they're on the show. And at least they're being used. So it's really not all that bad, in my opinion. But that's going to do it, guys, for episode 424. Here today of Hashtag Ask GSM, January 12th, 2022. Thank you guys, as always, for checking out the show. I appreciate it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Uh, be sure to, again, send in a question if you would like as well, at WrestleRant on Twitter with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Drop a question on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. And like I said at the start of the show, guys, be sure to check out my interviews right now with Alan Maldonado for Monday, Tuesday, Camille Costick, and Wednesday, today, Dan Housen, and my interview with uh, Ring of Honor World Champion Jonathan Gresham coming up probably at the end of the week. I know I said Braun Breaker last week. We're doing it for Bleacher Report, so it's going to be up next week instead. So keep an eye out for that. Have an awesome one, guys. Enjoy the rest of your month of January and the rest of your week. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.